are listening to the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. I am your host, Jennifer Blau, session number one. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the very first session of the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. I wanted to take the opportunity today to to do a solo show and the reason for this is I really want to lay the foundation um, and give you an idea of you know what exactly is compassion fatigue some of you may be very familiar with compassion fatigue and others maybe not so much so I wanted to start this by reading a couple passages from a book that I just wrote and released it's called To Save a Starfish, a Compassion Fatigue Workbook for the Animal Welfare Warrior. From the moment Kate Dubuque wakes up, her work begins. On a typical day, she's answered phone calls, responded to emails, cleaned kennels, bathed dogs, arranged for veterinary care, found foster homes, met with potential adopters, and this is all before lunchtime, too. Dubuque, a vet tech, is the founder of Little Roadie Rescue and Quarantine, a small animal rescue facility in Rhode Island. To date, the organization has been responsible for placing close to 9,000 dogs into loving homes. Yet, despite this accomplishment, Dubuque often feels overwhelmed by the sheer number of animals in need. She says, I don't necessarily feel like a failure, but I wish I had more help and the capacity to do more. That tendency to wish you could do more is always there. The reality that no matter what you do, there will always be more. Not only is there always more, but there is never enough. Never enough money, never enough time, and never enough homes. This harsh reality often leaves Dubuque feeling physically and emotionally exhausted and plagued with the thought, maybe you're not smart enough, capable enough, strong enough. Maybe you're not enough. The too much and not enough dilemma is common to animal rescuers around the globe, and it can play a major role in the development of both compassion fatigue as well as professional burnout. And while they share many similarities and can coexist, Compassion fatigue and burnout have some notable differences. According to Patricia Smith, burnout, unlike compassion fatigue, is a process that can slowly creep up on anyone, regardless of his or her profession. The founder of the Compassion Fatigue Awareness Project adds that burnout results from not enough, not enough time, not enough resources, not enough energy. Compassion fatigue, on the other hand, tends to occur more quickly and is unique to those working with suffering or traumatized populations. Throw in some stress, which Smith describes as too much, too much work, too much pressure, too many deadlines, and you're left feeling damaged by this perfect storm. Let's take a look at some of the symptoms associated with compassion fatigue. Now, if you're like many others in the helping professions, you might tend to put the needs of others before your own. But I really encourage you to take a few moments to get in touch with where you're at right now. These are some of the symptoms that people with compassion fatigue may display. See if any resonate with you. One of the first symptoms we have is depression or just feelings of sadness. You know, everyone gets the blues from time to time. But when feelings of sadness become chronic, this can indicate compassion fatigue or possibly even clinical depression. Depression can make you feel like life is being sucked out of you. It may be difficult to get out of bed in the morning, and you may feel like you're dragging yourself around all day. Negativity and apathy are also very common. 
you may feel like there's just no point to anything. Another symptom could be insomnia or even hypersomnia. So while many of us experience occasional trouble falling or staying asleep, insomnia can become downright debilitating when we experience it night after sleepless night. Hypersomnia, which is the tendency to sleep too much, can also have a negative impact on our personal and professional lives. Both could be signs of compassion fatigue. Maybe you're experiencing disturbing flashbacks or nightmares. Sometimes these disturbing images of the things that we witnessed can haunt our dreams and even creep up on us during our waking hours. These intrusive thoughts can cause great distress and can be symptomatic of compassion fatigue, but they're also common in those suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Perhaps you're feeling fatigued or have low energy. Animal welfare work, which can often seem like an uphill battle, can be downright exhausting at times. Combine the emotionally charged nature of the work with a lack of self-care, and you're likely to end up feeling drained. Another symptom of compassion fatigue is anger or irritability. This symptom, honestly, used to be a personal favorite of mine. People in the animal welfare community can sometimes become jaded by what they experience day in and day out. I know I certainly did. You add to that the often ignorant and difficult general public with their lack of understanding, you're bound to become angry or irritable. Another symptom is grief. We may not necessarily associate this symptom with animal welfare work, but if you think about it, you know, some of you witness or hear about death on a daily basis. Whether you perform euthanasia or you fight factory farming, grief is a very normal reaction to the inevitable losses that we so often face. Maybe you find that you're withdrawing from others. Who has the energy to be social after a long day of giving 110% of yourself to your work? Not to mention, who can you talk to who will really understand what you're going through? When compassion fatigue takes over, it's very common to want to go home, curl up in a ball in front of the TV, and just zone out. Feelings of isolation are very common in compassion fatigue. Given society's view on animals, it's no surprise that our beliefs and the work that we do can sometimes make us feel isolated. Euthanasia, for example, is not exactly an appropriate topic for the dinner table. Outside of the animal welfare community, it may be difficult for you to find others who can support, let alone understand, your cause, which can understandably lead to your feeling lonely or disconnected from friends, family, and sometimes even the world. Another common symptom is appetite changes. So perhaps you've lost your appetite or even the exact opposite extreme. Maybe you turn to food for comfort. If you're stress eating or not eating much at all, it may be that you have too much on your plate, so to speak, in the form of compassion fatigue or stress. A loss of interest or feelings of apathy can be very common symptoms of both compassion fatigue and depression. You may find that activities that you once enjoyed no longer bring you pleasure. Instead, you just walk around feeling kind of blah. Feelings of guilt can also be common. Animal welfare workers tend to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders. We really do put unrealistic and unfair expectations upon ourselves. And when we realize that we can't save them all, we sometimes feel like a failure. These feelings of guilt are sure to surface when we don't accept our own limitations. Lack of motivation can also creep in with compassion fatigue. So if you think about it, a life devoted to animal welfare can be overwhelming at times. In fact, we might feel so overwhelmed that we become paralyzed. We might feel hopeless or that the work we do is pointless. And so we may think, gosh, why even bother anymore? 
Perhaps you're noticing some relationship conflicts in your life. Compassion fatigue can drain us to the point where we find it difficult to get along with others. Conflict can creep up between you and your intimate partner, family and friends, co-workers and colleagues, and even clients and customers. Maybe you're experiencing feelings of emptiness. You know, sometimes we work so hard to give to others that we just have nothing left to give ourselves. We give and give to the point of depletion. Maybe your compassion, fatigue, and stress is now spilling over into your work. So maybe you've noticed that you've started to cut corners, or maybe you're habitually late to work. Whether you've been calling in sick more than usual, or simply find yourself not as productive while you used to be on the clock, keep in mind compassion fatigue can rear its ugly head on the job. Maybe you just feel numb like you're walking around like a zombie. Do you ever feel like you're just going through the motions? If you find yourself on autopilot most of the time, zoned out, or even less compassionate and caring than you used to be? chances are you've got a fairly high level of compassion fatigue. Another very, very common symptom in compassion fatigue is anxiety. Now, anxiety can manifest itself in several ways, mentally and physically. Perhaps you find yourself worrying all the time or often feel on edge. Or maybe you've noticed that your breathing is shallow or that your heart is beating fast. If this is the case, you need to listen to your body it's trying to tell you something. Low self-esteem can sometimes be a result of the work that we do. Sometimes our sense of self is based on the work we do for others. For example, when we adopt out that special animal or perform life-saving surgery, we feel really good about ourselves. But when we lose that animal abuse case or have to put an animal down, our self-esteem sometimes can reflect that. Maybe you're experiencing poor concentration. Like physical exhaustion, mental fatigue is a common symptom of compassion fatigue. And when chronic stress is combined with a lack of proper self-care, such as poor nutrition and sleep, brain fog can result, affecting our judgment and making it difficult to focus and make decisions. Maybe you're experiencing some body complaints. Do you suffer with daily headaches, stomach pains, or maybe even tight muscles? Have you been getting sick more than usual? While it's really important to have your doctor rule out any possible medical causes, these physical ailments could also be signs of compassion fatigue. Do you often feel like you're on guard? Just like emergency room doctors or firefighters, some of you often work through situations that involve life and death. Because of this, you've probably trained yourself to be ready to respond at the drop of a hat. But being in a constant state of hypervigilance, especially when you're off the clock, can cause a lot of health problems, both physical and mental. People that are experiencing compassion fatigue sometimes turn to unhealthy coping skills to get by. You know, we all need a vice. But when compassion fatigue sets in, we sometimes turn to things such as using drugs or alcohol, binge eating, impulsive shopping, or having unsafe sex. While they may seem to help in the moment, these risky behaviors are really just band-aids that only hurt us in the long run. It's also common to adopt a negative worldview. It can be difficult for us to appreciate the positive things in our lives when we're exposed to so much suffering. Our whole outlook may change or we may start to feel hopeless about our future. And finally, and sadly, suicide is a huge problem in the animal welfare community. Have you ever felt so overwhelmed or helpless that you believe that suicide was the only way out? If you're consumed with thoughts of death and dying, you may be suffering from a very severe form of compassion fatigue or depression. If this is the case, please know that help is available. It is imperative that you find a mental health professional 
to help you cope with the deep pain that you're feeling. Now, if any of those symptoms sound all too familiar to you, you may be suffering from compassion fatigue. Now, this is not to say that compassion fatigue is an illness. It's not a mental disorder. It's so important that you remember you're not sick, you're not weak, you're not crazy, and most importantly, you are not alone. Compassion fatigue is simply the consequence of caring for others. It's very common to so many other helping professionals, including police officers, firefighters, nurses, paramedics, even therapists. Compassion fatigue has been described by traumatologist Charles Figley as the cost of caring for others in emotional pain. He adds that the display of symptoms is the natural consequence of stress resulting from caring for and helping traumatized or suffering people or animals. So in other words, whether you're a humane officer or a shelter volunteer, a vet tech, or an animal rights activist, you have likely seen, heard about, or experienced things that most people can't even begin to imagine, let alone understand. Long-term exposure to abuse and neglect, trauma, euthanasia, grief-stricken clients, not only impacts your work productivity and satisfaction, but it can also wear on you mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. If you don't learn to manage the stress associated with helping others, your compassion satisfaction can slowly fade, leaving you feeling angry, depressed, anxious, physically exhausted, and emotionally drained. Compassion fatigue can affect your professional life and spill over into your personal life. Eventually, it may even lead to burnout, which sadly causes some people to leave the field altogether. So does this mean that if you choose to devote yourself to helping animals, that you're destined to a life of suffering? Absolutely not. You know, one of the most important advancements in animal welfare, in my opinion, is the acknowledgement that compassion fatigue exists. It's such a common topic of discussion in other helping fields like nursing, social work, and counseling. And although it may seem like sometimes animal welfare is considered the red-headed stepchild of the helping professions, the good news is that we've begun to recognize it. You know, when I started in this field, we didn't talk about it. I didn't even know there was a name for what I was going through. But this has got to change because so many of you out there are crashing and burning. Did you know that animal control officers have the highest suicide rate, along with police officers and firefighters, of all workers in the United States? In fact, recent research revealed that an alarming one in six veterinarians in the United States has considered suicide. Another study revealed that vets in the United Kingdom have a suicide rate of an astonishing four times the general population. You guys, we've got to start talking about this. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this podcast. We are going to talk about compassion fatigue in all sorts of areas, whether it's the veterinary industry, shelters, humane societies, pet sitting, you name it, we are going to address it. So what exactly is the antidote to compassion fatigue then? Well, that's something else we're going to address in this podcast. Currently, what we know is it's a combination of things, primarily self-care. This is something that helping professions often struggle with. We're also going to talk about support. So let's take the former. What does that look like? Think of self-care as a way to recharge your battery. People I've met and worked with in the animal welfare field often feel guilty or even selfish when they take time for themselves, and I got to admit I felt that way too. You know, it took me a long time to realize that if I didn't take care of myself, I really couldn't take very good care of animals either. 
So whether you are new to the animal welfare community or a seasoned veteran, this podcast is going to be all about you. It's designed to help you recognize the symptoms and warning signs of compassion fatigue so you can take steps to prevent, manage, or even overcome compassion fatigue. This podcast is for shelter workers and volunteers, animal control officers, veterinary staff, rescue workers, trainers and behaviorists, wildlife rehabilitators, humane investigators, animal attorneys, foster parents, ethical vegetarians and vegans, animal rights activists, pet sitters, dog walkers, groomers, and of course just all around animal lovers. For all of you guys out there, whether you're behind the scenes or on the front lines, fighting to protect innocent animals, this podcast is dedicated to you. As someone who has worked in the trenches, it is my hope that I can now offer what you might need the most, compassion, validation, and understanding, along with some ammunition to help you wage this battle. For every one we save, there are countless others who need us, and sometimes the best way to help them is to help ourselves. So I hope that you will tune into this podcast each and every week. Of course, if you enjoy this podcast, I hope you'll also check out my new book. It's called To Save a Starfish, a compassion fatigue workbook for the animal welfare warrior. Available now on Amazon.com. If you would like more information and resources, please head over to the show notes on thecompassionfatiguepodcast.com. You can also leave me a message. I would love to hear from you if there are topics that you would like to see covered in this podcast. Please feel free to head over to the compassionfatiguepodcast.com and leave me a note. You can also reach me at compassionfatiguepodcast at gmail.com. Please let me know what you think of the podcast. And again, feel free to uh, suggest any topics that you would love to see covered. If you could do me one other favor, in order to get this podcast in the ears of so many of our colleagues that could benefit from this information, please head over to iTunes. There you can subscribe to this podcast. And also, if you wouldn't mind leaving a positive review, that will really help to boost our presence so that so many other people who would benefit from this information are able to find us. I really want to thank you for joining me today on the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. I hope you will tune in next week. Our guest is Dr. Carrie Lajeunesse. She is a former veterinarian and an expert on the human-animal bond, companion animal grief, and the impact that these things can have on compassion fatigue and our well-being. Thank you for listening to the Compassion Fatigue Podcast. Please note that this podcast is not meant to provide medical advice or substitute for psychological care. Please consult with a mental health professional if you need additional support.